Good morning. Let's all stand and grab our hymns to turn to At the Cross 323. shape this morning, but uh, God let us be here today, and uh, we're thankful to be here, and uh, thankful to have all of our guests, uh, thankful to have those back that have been sick and in the hospital, and um, certainly prayers have been answered. Uh, Kevin, it's good to see you, bud. I'm glad you're back. Um, uh, just have a few announcements as we ask our ushers to go ahead and make their way to the front as we prepare for the offering. Um, just want to remember, we have uh, Brother Robert Wallace here this morning. Um, <laughs> I was told to mention he is the vice president of TBI. <laughs> so, uh, but hey, they've had a lot of good stuff going on, getting accredited over this last year. That was that was 2023, right? We, uh, TBI is now fully accredited. So, and he was a big part of that. Uh, he'll be bringing the message this morning, and so y'all keep him in your prayers as well. Um, just so you know, Easter's coming up, and Brother Pete wanted me to mention that at the at the service, the end of the service today, there's going to be about a hundred of these tickets out. These are. These are tickets for the Easter program. This is what they look like. Uh, we're asking that everyone uh, take some of these and hand them out in the community. It, it, it obviously gives a little bit more tactile kind of awareness when you hand somebody a ticket and say, hey, I got this for you uh, to come to Easter. So most importantly, they can hear the word of God. And um, if they don't know Jesus, they'll come to know him before it's too late. And then it has the address here, the time that the Easter cantata starts. And also about the uh, egg hunt that Miss Maddie has going. It's on the back, so it's a lot of information. Um, please, we ask that you take these and give these out. Don't, don't let your kids take them and just take them and tear them apart, okay? We want to give these out to as many people as we can in the community. I believe we have about 500 or so. Is that right, Chad? Um, so uh, please, please, please take some of these. Give them to a stranger. It doesn't have to be somebody you know. Just invite them so we can love on them, okay? Um, at this time... Um, I'm going to ask Brother Garrett Titlow if you'll open up with a word of prayer, bud.
I'd ask you to turn to your hymn, the next one, but it's in the old hymn. But we're going to sing 188, Come Unto Me. Hear the blessed Savior calling the oppressed. Oh, ye heavy laden, come to me and rest. Come no longer tarry, I your Lord will bear. Has a sense of weakness, brought distress within. Christ will sanctify you if your claim is best. In the Holy Spirit, He will give you rest. So come, God, to me, and I. Turn to him 685 and sing the footsteps of Jesus. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard the calling? Come, follow me. And we see where the footprints falling lead us to thee. that make the path we go. We will follow the steps of Jesus where there they go. Though they lead o'er the cold dark mountain seeking his sheep. For along by Siloam's fountains held So we go ahead and stand. We've got one more song we do. And this is going to be a glorious day. Let me love me. And 
let's just lift up the name of God this morning. And Heavenly Father, we love you so much and thank you for this time you've given us to come into your house to worship. We thank you for the freedom that we have to do this. We thank you for the freedoms that we continue to live every day to lift up your name and, and uh, say how we feel about you to those that don't know you, Lord. I just pray that you continue to bless this church, uh, bless our work for your kingdom, Lord. And I pray that you'll be here with Brother Robert this morning as he brings a message. And Lord, we most of all thank you for Jesus and you send him to die on the cross for us. And it's a cross I pray, amen. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. And the word came flesh. And the light shined among us, and His glory revealed. Oh, living He loved me, and dying He saved me. Buried He carried my sins far away. For rising He justified. out on a tree and he took the nails from me
Father, we thank you so much for giving us this great day, this glorious day, to come here and to, to celebrate and to learn and to worship on this beautiful, beautiful day. Father, we, we love you and praise you for all that you are and all that you do that give us the reason to praise and celebrate and ask, us, ask you to forgive us of our sins and those things that come in the way of us hearing from your word exactly what you want us to hear we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Wait a minute. I understand that some of y'all forgot about this morning last night, right? I heard, I heard some comedian somewhere, he said, you know, uh, nighttime me puts a lot of problems on morning me. Right? Because nighttime me says, oh, don't worry about that. That's morning me's problem. Well, some of y'all last night, you knew the time change was coming, but nighttime you was like, oh, it's only. <laughs> yeah, but morning you's going, what were you thinking? <laughs> right? Now, I'm just going to give you a fair warning. <clears throat> I just looked down, and I have, this is a watch that has to be changed, and I haven't changed this one, so we may be here a while. All right? <laughs> So, y'all better hope that, that y'all want me to put my phone up here that automatically changes so I can see. Now, here's the thing. I am so glad to be back here at Landmark, but I can tell you this. It's always good to be made to feel at home. I walked in the door this morning, and one of the first things I heard was, oh, no. <laughs> and then one of the next few things I heard was, yuck. <laughs> Yeah, I heard that. And then one of my really good friends came in and said, hey, the 80s called and they want that jacket back, okay? <laughs> said maybe it was the 70s, I don't know. So, um, yeah, and as I say, I could have stayed home and get treated like this, right? I didn't have to come all the way here to do that. But I am glad that you're com we're comfortable together, maybe? Is that what that is? So, uh, and, 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 some, and several have made the comment, just take this thing off. And I said that, I tried to warn them, I, they know that, but I tried to tell them, don't do it. And they said, well, those people in Africa, I said, they can hear me anyway, okay? So, it's their fault, not mine. So, cover your ears, plug them, whatever it is you got to do, all right? So, uh, Brother Pete, I also have heard that Brother Pete did not reveal who was coming to speak today. And I know why. Because some of y'all would have just stayed in that bed this morning. I know how it is, Carl. Uh, <laughs> so, um, huh? You knew I was coming. Oh, yeah, y'all had that conversation. I, I got that text. That's right. So, um, but, but I am glad to be here, I think. All right? So, uh, Brother Pete did ask me, though, he said, uh, when we were talking about me coming, he said he did want me to talk a little bit about, about the school. Well, I'll talk a little bit about the school. Now, Austin made the point, and I, I don't know who told him to say that, but he made the point about, you know, what my position is. Well, I, he didn't get it right, so let me clarify, all right, because I've earned this, all right? I am the Vice President of Advancement and Chief Financial Officer of Texas Baptist Institute and Seminary. Are y'all impressed? <laughs> Woo! Man, that is awesome. Now, my business cards cost more to print now because of all of that. But 
Here's what I always tell people. They say, what does that mean? And I said, well, I do the exact same thing I did when I was called treasurer, okay? <laughs> That's what my title started as, and I don't really do anything different. So maybe some of you work at places like I do where you get titles and not raises. Is that how that works? So uh, my title just grows. But, uh, but I am very, very honored uh, to have the privilege to serve at the seminary and one thing that I, one of my jobs is public relations or promotions or marketing or whatever you want to call that. And, and one of the really interesting things I get to do uh, is, is go to things like college fairs and, and things like that at schools. And it's amazing to me. Now, I go to college, I went to a college fair or a career fair at Henderson High School uh, Friday morning. Now, this is Henderson High School, That where Henderson High School is located, you can almost throw a rock and hit our campus from there, okay? And it always blows my mind because I look at these kids and I say, did y'all know Henderson has a college? And they go, what? <laughs> no. And I said, oh, well, I know. We, it, it's kind of new. We've only been there since 1948. So, you know, we're 75 years old. I can understand how y'all didn't know that, okay? Well, I know there may be some of you here this morning going, wait, Henderson has a college? That's okay. Uh, but yes, we do. Um, and, and so we are trying to get the word out. Apparently, we're not doing a very good job, so we need your help, all right? So y'all help people know Henderson does have a college, and it's called Texas Baptist Institute and Seminary. And you say, well, okay, but that's just a preacher school. Well, not exactly. Uh, we used to be known as just a preacher school, but now we offer a lot of different things. Um, we, we offer degrees all the way from associates to doctorate, and we offer things like music ministry, youth ministry, children's ministry. We're adding women's ministry, um, uh, missions, uh, church revitalization, you know, all these kinds of things. Well, that all sounds preachery. Yeah, it is. It's ministry. Uh, but let me say this as well, because this is something that you can help us do. How many of you have ever known of a, a 17, 18-year-old kid who is about to graduate high school, you say, what are you going to do next year? And they go, I don't know. <laughs> well, where are you going to go? I don't know. <laughs> well, we, they, how many of them say, I think I'm just going to take a year off and kind of figure that out? Well, how many of them take that year off and they just stay off? <laughs> okay. Well, we're trying to promote something that we're calling a year of discovery. So for those who are on the fence about what they want to do, where they want to go, what they want to major in, all those kinds of things, um, we're saying, look, we are now an accredited school, and you can come and you can take basics. We teach English. We teach history. We teach psychology. We teach math. We teach, we teach these things, but we teach them all from a biblical worldview, okay, from a Christian worldview, from a church view. But they're still, that's still the same, the same class. It's just from a different perspective. And we have called all the universities around us, and they will all accept those credits as transfer credits. So they could come. They don't know what they want to do. They don't know where they want to go. And you don't want them going off to some big four-year school and wasting a bunch of money and all of that and getting off and doing that. Well, we're right there. And they can come, they can take those classes in a small setting where they won't get lost from a, from a biblical worldview. And then they can spend that year figuring out what is it that God wants me to do and where do I want to go. Oh, and by the way, it's inexpensive. It's so inexpensive, it really should be called cheap, okay? Uh, and especially if they come from a church like Landmark, that associates with the American Baptist Association, all it takes is signing one, the church voting and signing one form. They get an automatic 50% scholarship off our already low tuition. Okay? So, they can come for a year, figure it out, and if they say, well, I don't want to live at home and do that, well, we have apartments there too, and our most expensive rent is $425 a month. You get a roommate, you cut that in half. 
Okay? How many, how many of y'all want to sign up for some classes? All right? Yeah. <laughs> Woo, man. And that's a newly remodeled apartment with all new appliances. How about that one? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. You have to take at least six credit hours to be eligible for those apartments. So, uh, we have a few available if some of y'all are looking for a cheap place to live. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I just throw all that information out there because people go, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize all of that. Yeah. And we also offer, for those who say, well, I'm not getting a college degree or whatever. Well, you just like Bible knowledge. We also offer Bible certificate classes. Those are those for people that say, I just want the knowledge. I don't care about the degree. Bible certificate classes only cost $85 a class. Okay? And it's the same class, and you, you get all the same information that we teach on campus. You get, you get lecture. You get all of that. Uh, and there's a little bit of work to do, but you don't get grades, okay? School without grades, whoo, <laughs> sounds, like sounds like a great thing, doesn't it? So, yeah, so we have lots of different options. So we have something for everybody, and everything can be done either on campus or live streamed, we're participating live stream, or if schedule, if you're working, whatever, you can't do that, we record it, and you, you, if you're taking it for credit, you have a week to watch it, get your work done, okay? So we make it about as easy as it can be uh, to, to do school. So just want to throw that out there to let you know in case you might be interested in something, but you know other people. Also, the last thing I'm going to say about school is uh, we are also in the process Yes, uh, we, we do have to have that thing called money. Y'all heard about that, right? Uh, and I want to say thank you for what, for what this church has done over the years and is still doing. But we have, a, um, we have a capital campaign going on right now because even though we, we have become accredited and we do school uh, according to our site visit teams, our, our distance learning, our online learning is superior to almost all other higher education nationwide, regardless of what school you want to talk about, they said that. We didn't say that. They said that. The way we do it is, is they said if everybody did it like you, it would revolutionize distance learning. That's their words, okay? Uh, but if any of you drive by our campus, Philip, where'd you go? Where's Philip? Is he still in here? He ran. Oh, yeah, he ran. That's what it was. Okay. He can't handle the truth. That's right, Jacob. Uh, but, yeah, so if you drive by our campus, you will drive by and say, oh, the 70s called, and there's our campus. Okay? So we need to, if, we're, if we are an ultra-modern school, we feel like we ought to at least bring our, our campus up to look a little bit like maybe you know, let's at least get it to the 90s maybe or something. I don't know. So we are trying to raise money uh, to, to do that. And so we are looking for, and, and, and this first phase is trying to get, it's, it's for aesthetics, which is, that, that's a fancy way of saying looks, okay? Uh, it's for aesthetics, it's for security and safety, and it's for infrastructure. You know, parking lots are falling apart, things like that. So it's new parking, new lighting, new signage, new fencing, all those kinds of things. And it's getting everything ready for new buildings that will be coming, okay? So uh, maybe you don't have, you, you can't write a check for $2 million that would actually cash. Uh, but every little drop counts. And you may know of individuals or businesses or foundations or something that we could talk to uh, that might be able to, to, to donate some money. If you do, let us know. Uh, I'd love to go visit with them. Uh, matter of fact, if you know of somebody like that and you will set up a lunch, I'll buy your lunch too. Okay? Uh, so I'll buy theirs and yours. So uh, that's, that's what we're trying to do. So all that being said, y'all didn't come here for a commercial, but... Brother Pete, I have to do what your pastor told me to do, right? He, he told me to do that. So I, I did that, and uh, that, I guess that was being, that's somehow documented online or something so he can watch. And so, and by the way, Pete, you're watching. We're having fun without you, okay? So, uh, but <clears throat> how many of you, how many of you been to the eye doctor lately? Been to the eye doctor? Yeah. So you go to the eye doctor, and what are they trying to get you to? They're trying to say they want you to have what kind of vision? 
2020, right? 2020 vision. So, I am not a doctor, okay? I'm not an optometrist. Maybe I made a typo. Because today, we're going to be talking about 2027 vision, okay? Now, I know that's just, that seems a little off kilter, doesn't it? Well, those of you that know me know I stay off kilter, right? Uh, so, that, that's okay. But we're going we're gonna to look at Matthew chapter 20. And we're going to read, uh, we're gonna read a passage uh, that, that I'm sure that, that most of you have heard of, you've seen. Um, and by the way, spoiler alert, how many of you watch the Chosen series? Any of y'all watch the Chosen? Okay. How many of you have been the overachievers like my wife and me and have already seen all of season four? Ooh, season four is not even out yet. Yes, if you went and paid $12 a piece at the movie theater three different times, then you could have watched all of season four, okay? Yes, that's my wife. So, anyway, uh, we, we have already seen season four. So, spoiler alert for those of you that watch The Chosen. In season four, they deal with this passage, all right? So, I'm just going to, I'm giving you a, a, a head start. And, you know, it's always funny. They hope they leave you with that cliffhanger and it's like, ooh, what, what's coming next? It's like, gee, if only we had a Bible or something we could read to know what was coming next. So anyway, so maybe it's not such a spoiler because you already know what's there. But when we read the Bible, we're going to read this passage, but when we read the Bible, I think many of us and many times we have an issue. And that is we, we read the Bible and we read about these people in the Bible and we put them up on a pedestal, don't we? Oh, Peter. Oh, John. Oh, you know, we put them up on a pedestal, don't we? What we forget is they were just people, just like us. They were just people. Now, I've said many, 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 many times, I am so glad that God did not see fit for me to be born during the time the Bible was being written. Because if I'd have been around during that time, I'd be the one y'all be reading about going, man, what an idiot. <laughs> okay? Don't we have those people in the Bible who are like, whoa, what are they thinking? That would be me. All right? All right? So I'm just thinking, I, I thank God regularly that I was not born during that time. So these people are just like us, okay? And so many times we forget that. And when we read the Bible, we read it very sterilely, which I realize that's not a word, okay? But we read it in a sterile manner. In other words, we just read words. <laughs> and we don't think about people. I think that's one of the things that's, that, that series like The Chosen, even though they sometimes don't get it right in the way I would do it or the way I think it should be, but, uh, but it at least lets you see that these were people. And so we're going to read this passage all the way through just like we would normally read the Bible. Then we're going to go back and we're going to look at it as if maybe these were people, okay? So let's look. Matthew chapter 20, starting with verse 20. says, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? What do you want? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, you know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, uh, 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 they say unto him, we are able. And he saith unto them, ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father." And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. 
And Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, is that how we read the Bible? Yeah. You got it? We're good? Can we just close it up and go home? Okay. Well, let's take a couple of more minutes at least, all right? Um, we don't want to beat the Methodist to the restaurant that bad, okay? So, um, but let's go back and let's think about this and let's read this as if they are people, okay? So, you look at verse 20. talks about the mother of Zebedee's children, now, who are the mother, who, who are Zebedee's children? James and John. We got a few studious people in here, all right? I noticed David didn't answer, but that's okay. His seminary education apparently didn't take. I'm sorry, David. You need to come back and take some more classes. Uh, but James and John. Now, when we talk about who were James and John, well, James and John were, uh, were, were two of the apostles, and they were also a part of the inner circle. So, you know, Jesus had a good relationship with all the apostles, but there was Peter, James, and John. They were what we would term the inner circle based on how Jesus treated them at certain times. And so, um, and we have seen, uh, we, we, in several occasions, we heard about James and John. Uh, we've we've heard, them, heard about their father, Zebedee, and all that kinds of stuff. But James and John also had a nickname, not individually, but as a pair. Anybody know what their nickname was as a pair? Sons of Thunder. Okay? Now, can I get myself in trouble, Jacob? Okay, all right. Sons of Thunder. Well, let's see. It mentions several times that their father's name was Zebedee. It never mentions their mother's name. Hmm, sons of thunder. Hmm, could it be that mama was the thunder? Okay. Everybody, I've, I've heard people a lot of times say, well, Zebedee must have been quite the guy because, you know, they call him sons of thunder. Yeah, but we know his name. Maybe it was mama that was the thunder. Okay, I don't know. Any of y'all got a mama that might have been known as as thunder? Any of y'all mamas want to claim you are thunder? Uh, that may be okay. I know my boys, would, Carl asked Luke and say, and Kenneth asked Luke, said, Who, who's the thunder in, in, in our house? And they'll tell you, mom, real quick. Okay, they're scared of mom. They're not scared of dad. Um, but, so I don't know that that's the case, but mom apparently had a personality about her. At least according to this. And so, what did she do? She went and she was worshiping Jesus, but she had a question. Now, I know we have some mothers in here. And I know a thing or two about mothers. And I have never, ever heard a mother talk about their child and say, my kid is dumb as a brick. <laughs> my kid is uglier than homemade soap. <laughs> you know, you ever heard mama say that? Oh no, you talk to a mama and maybe the kid is dumb as a brick and ugly as homemade soap, but you'll never hear a mama say that. We, oh, he's so beautiful. Oh, he's so smart. You know, uh, was it Jeff Foxworthy that talked about his nephew and said he's standing in the yard and Looked up in the sky, and the kid said, Ed Payne. He said, well, my goodness, the kid's 14, you know. So, you know, yeah. So, yeah, but his mama would say he was so smart, you know. So, here's mama. Mamas are always trying to promote their child, right? So, as mama comes to Jesus... Now, it is kind of funny how this all goes down in The Chosen for those of you that do watch, that watch that. But she had a request. And you go, well, what's wrong with this request? What was her request? So she went to Jesus. Now, you know, 
How many of you just bust up into the middle of the conversation with the Son of God? You know? Uh, but apparently Thunder would. So anyway, uh, and he, he, he was like, okay, what's your request? And she said, grant that these my two sons may sit the one on your right hand and the other on the left in the kingdom. Hmm. What's she saying? Jesus, we know you're the king. We know you're going to set up a kingdom. We know all that. She said, I want to make sure when you're sitting on the throne as the king, I want one of my boys on one side and one of them on the other. Now, why would she want that? Well, that's her babies, right? And she wants them up there because they're so good. They're the best. But is there also the possibility that... It was a little selfish on her part, too. Because I know y'all never know of a mama who, if their kids were sitting one on the right, one on the left, would stand out in the crowd and say, mm-hmm, that's my boys. <laughs> that's my baby. <laughs> right? <laughs> Is it possible that she was wanting a little something-something for herself? <laughs> okay? She's trying to say, yeah, I want my boys promoted because it'll make me look good. I highly doubt that mama was doing this for some ultimately spiritual reason, <laughs> okay? It was pure selfishness, I'm quite certain. And so James and John, being good sons, did they, did they go along? <laughs> yeah, they went along. But what was Jesus' response? He says, you don't know what you're asking, said, you don't even know what you're asking. Now, I'm going to tell you, Jesus was a lot nicer than I would have been. Because let's look back just a few verses. If you look back at verse, uh, eight, verses 18 and 19, he's talking about, he says, Behold, we will go up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man shall be betrayed, betrayed unto unto the chief priests and unto the scribes and shall condemn him to death and they shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him and the third day he shall rise again. He had just told them I'm about to go and be betrayed and be tortured and crucified. <laughs> okay? He's trying to prepare them for the fact that things are about to get real. And he's trying to he, he's trying to prepare them and help them understand, guys, we got some big time stuff about to happen. And life is fixing to change forever. Some of y'all, you realize that right now, four years ago, it was right before the world changed forever. <laughs> you know, that little, I don't know, what they, what they call it, that uh COVID? Is that what it's called? Oh, yeah. You, you hadn't heard of that. You, you seen any of that in your, your practice? I don't know. Just a little bit? Yeah. Uh, yeah, a little thing called COVID. How many of us, you know, it'd be the equivalent of the Sunday before, the day before COVID changed the world. Somebody's up here saying, hey, there's this thing and it's about to happen. Live up today, you know, because get ready. It's coming and it's going to do all this stuff. And then we go, hey, by the way, I'd really like something for me. But Jesus is telling them this. Look, this is what's about to happen. And, that, and immediately on the heels of that, Mama and the apostles and everybody apparently were just not listening. <laughs> Any of y'all ever try to warn somebody about something and then they just turn around and tell you, ask you some stupid question? <laughs> Aren't you real nice up to them when that happens? <laughs> You would never blow up on them, would you? You would never explode. If I'd have been Jesus, I believe I'd have exploded. <laughs> now, he may have had a little venom in his voice at that point. I don't know. We don't, we don't have the tone recorded. It's just words. But he said, you don't know what you're asking. Hmm. Why would he say that? Well, you know, we don't know... The Bible doesn't tell us everything about heaven. doesn't tell us everything about how things are going to be. And I think there's, that's good 
to a degree because that leaves a little, little something to be excited about, a little, little curiosity. But, you know, I don't know everything about heaven, but there's one thing that I know for sure about heaven. And what I know about heaven is I know something about the seating arrangement. And you do too. Because there's God the Father is sitting on the throne, right? And how many times? We have it in Scripture. Jesus sits where? On his right. Hmm. So why would he say you don't know what you're asking? What did she say? She said, when the kingdom's set up, I want one of my boys to sit on your right and on your left. Hmm. In the kingdom, who sits on the left of Jesus? God the Father. Wait a minute. Mama, are you really saying that you want me to tell my daddy to get up out of his chair and let your boy sit there? <laughs> you are so clueless. You have, no, you have let your... Your pride, your, your whatever it is, get in the way of common sense. He says, you don't know what you're asking. But then he went on to say, he, he, he's trying to make a point here. He's trying to go back to verses 18 and 19, where he says, are you able to drink of the cup that I'll drink of and be baptized, with baptism, bap, be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? What he's referring to is back up here that verses 18 and 19 said, look, you want to sit in those places in the kingdom? Are you able to go to the cross? Are you able to sacrifice your life? Are you able to do all those things for the kingdom? That's what he's referring to. Now, how many times do we let pride and, and, and promoting ourselves make us make dumb decisions or say dumb things. What did they respond to that with? Uh-huh. <laughs> it says, we are able. <laughs> Don't have a clue what you're talking about because we weren't listening when you were talking in verses 18 and 19, but we can do that if that means we can sit in those chairs. <laughs> How many times... Are we like that? Yeah, I can do it. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> you don't even know what we're talking about. But that's what they did. And in verse 23, he said to them, You shall indeed drink of my cup and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. And then here's how we know about that seating arrangement thing. He says, But to sit on my right hand and on my left... Is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared to my father. You know how I read that? I read that, and he says, if my daddy wants to get up out of his chair and let your boy sit there, that's on him. I can't answer for him. <laughs> right? <laughs> that's not my choice. <laughs> but that's kind of what he's saying. And yeah, do we know that James and John did indeed die a martyr's death? Well, according to extra biblical history, yeah, that's, that is what happened. They did die a martyr's death. They did drink of that cup. And we're baptized with that baptism. But he said, even with all of that, even, if you, even though you are going to do that. And see, again, they weren't listening because he just told them, you're going to suffer a fate very similar to mine. Now, if mama had been listening and they had been listening, that would have been a very sobering thought, wouldn't it? Because he had just told them what he was going to go through. You see how we, we, just, we just get this tunnel vision we get our, our eyes focused on what we want. We get, none of y'all ever been guilty of this, have you? Okay? That we, we just don't even listen to what God has to say. And we just, we get focused on what we want. And we're just dead set. This is what's going to happen. And I don't care what it takes. And I don't care what you say. We're going to make this happen. Classic example right here in, with Jesus. Now, how many of you have ever been listening to or overhearing a conversation where somebody's getting roasted? <laughs> and y'all ever done that? Y'all ever been in a place and somebody's like, ooh? <laughs> and, and, and how many times maybe is it something that you're like, ooh, I'm glad my mama didn't do that. You know, <laughs> I'm glad they didn't ask, me, ask for my spot. You know, normally you would think if you were listening to this conversation because she obviously didn't do it in private, 
you would think the rest of them would be like, wow, <laughs> that was crazy. Man, I'm just going to step back, <laughs> and I'm just going to step off over here, and I'm going to pretend like I didn't hear it, and hopefully I won't get caught up in that conversation. <sighs> Except that's not what happened. What happened in verse 24? And when the ten heard it, who are the ten? The other ten apostles. When the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. Now, that's how it's written. What did it say? They got mad. <laughs> they got mad at them going, who do they think they are going to sit up there? Why they got their mama up there? I should have got my mama to go over there and talk to them. Oh, no, they don't deserve that. I deserve to be there. And I don't... Don't talk about we read the Bible so sterilely. Okay, really? They, it says they were moved with indignation. Can you hear them over there talking? Blah, 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 blah. I know none of y'all would ever be that way. And y but y'all know people like that, right? <laughs> but that's what they did. So here they are. And, and can you imagine Jesus hearing all of this and knowing all this going on? What had he just told him in verses 18 and 19? And here they are, grumbling and griping and pouting and <laughs> all these other things. And then what they were doing? And the whole time he's like, guys, I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you. This, <laughs> it's happening. <laughs> and all they could worry about was that. Who's going to get to sit in the big chair? And who's going to get the spot? And who's going to be in this position, in that position? They're already jockeying for their positions in the kingdom. And Jesus just told them, the kingdom is not coming right now. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that's got to happen between now and then. Mm. Again, <laughs> Jesus was a lot more gracious than I would have been. Any of y'all ever, any of y'all with kids, your kids ever do stuff like this? Do you just go, okay, let's just, let's just calm down and let's, okay, maybe some of y'all do, but that's not in my temperament, okay? <laughs> no, that's, that, I would have been like Jesus with the cat of nine tails and turning the tables over at that point in time. <laughs> I'd have been like, man, I'm just going <laughs> to, yeah. <laughs> And, 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 and I would have been going back to verse 18 and 19. And I said, did you not hear me? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> oh, wait, that's not a kind word, is it? I'm sorry. But <laughs> if I was Jesus, that's what I would have done. <laughs> but Jesus is a little better than me, okay? Or maybe a whole lot better than me. So verse 25 Jesus called them to him. Now, see, see, I would have called that a come to Jesus meeting. Y'all ever have one of those? All right. Kenneth, you ever have to have a come to Jesus meeting at work? <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll talk later. Okay. But come to Jesus meetings. All right. He just had a come to Jesus meeting. He pulled them together and he said, all right. He says, listen. You know the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority on them. What do you say? In the Gentile world, because there's Jews and Gentiles, and they were all Jews, and the Gentiles were the filthy, rotten dogs. All right? So he said, you all know in the, in the filthy, rotten dog world, they have their leaders who exercise authority on them. They got the big dog. They're the filthy, rotten dogs. So they got the big dogs and the little dogs. And the big dogs rule over the little dogs. Now, what he told them? He said, yeah, that's how the filthy, rotten dog world works. And by the way, is that how our filthy, rotten dog world today works? You got people that they're the bosses and we're the little people. And, you know, we're just there. We're just supposed to do what they say. Don't worry about it. Verse 26. He changed the whole story. He says, but. He says, yeah, that's how it works in the world. He says, but it shall not be so among 
you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man, Jesus, came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He says, yeah, in my kingdom, you want to sit in the big chair? It's not going to be because your mama asked for it. It's not going to be because you whined and complained enough to get it. It's because you were a servant. Now, I know you say, okay, good, we're almost done. Yes, we are almost done. But I want to bring this down to something we can really understand. I want to tell you about a time that this really, really hit me. Many of you all know that for several years, I was, I was involved with a ministry that I traveled a lot. And I traveled all over the world. I was, I've done ministry in 30-something states and five continents, Okay. So I got to see a lot of stuff. And, you know, especially when I would go to some of those what we call third world countries, you know, I would show up as the, as the big, you know, the big guy from America and all that. And, you know, I was kind of sometimes carried around and you know, I was put on a pedestal and, you know, all those kinds of things. <clears throat> well, the first trip that I made to the Philippines, uh, I made this trip and, uh, it's one that several people said I shouldn't have done, okay? Um, because I flew to the Philippines by myself. The people who were supposed to meet me or the man who was supposed to meet me at the airport, I had never met. I had only communicated with him through email. Um, didn't know what he looked like. He didn't know what I looked like. And I was to fly to the Philippines uh, get to Manila, they were going to pick me up, and then we were going to spend eight or so days driving from the northern part of the Philippines to the southernmost city. And that was about an eight-day trip, and it involved a lot of interesting experiences along the way. But the whole purpose of it was that we were, to, we were going to, we were headed to a national camp is what we were doing. I was supposed to be speaking for their national youth camp. And so we were going to drive down this whole thing, but every night we were going to stop at a place where we had a mission point or a church, and we were going to do what they call a crusade. And we were going to try to, you know, do something to help those missions and those churches, and then we would be adding to our little caravan headed to, headed to camp as we went along. So, that's what we did. I could spend the rest of the day telling you about that trip because it was, it was a trip. Um, but we did these crusades, and they were, they were okay. Uh, they didn't do them like I would, but we would show up at the local basketball court, which was the community gathering place, and uh, we would show up there, and they would set up a stage, and they would set up a screen and some equipment, and they would, uh, they would play some music, and uh, people would start showing up, and then they would uh, show. Some of y'all remember those really cheesy Christian movies from the 80s and so that were, you know, it's always, you know, you're going to be left behind and all this kind of stuff. Well, it was those, they would show one of those cheesy movies that was in English originally, but had been overdubbed with Tagalog, their language. So it was like watching one of those Godzilla movies that was originally in Japanese, and then the English comes out kind of thing, okay? And so they would, show, they would start showing one of those movies, and they'd get about halfway through, and they would stop it, and then they would have me get up and do a gospel presentation. And then we would have an invitation. And then once we did that, they'd show the rest of the movie. So that was the way the Crusades went. Well, we had done three or four of them, something like that. And they had been okay. We'd gather a crowd and, you know, there'd be a little response to an invitation, that kind of thing. They were okay. But we got down and we had, we had been traveling for quite a while at this point And we got to this place called Butuan City. And Butuan City, 
they had a really nice church building there and had a really good church there. But uh, they want us to do this crusade. Well, the city wouldn't allow us to do the crusade in, uh, in the middle of the city. So they let us go out to uh, this, what, they, what they called Southern California. <laughs> okay? So I went all the way to the middle of the Philippines to go to Southern California. Uh, but what this was, this was a squatter's village. And in the Philippines, if you didn't have a place to, to live... You could just go, claim a spot, throw up a little shelter, and they would even hook up electricity to you and that kind of thing. Just a squatter's village. Well, a bunch of squatters had, had come in to Butuan City that has a river that runs through it, and they had set up this huge squatter's village right in the floodplain of the river. And so the city got really concerned because they were afraid that you know a flood was going to come through and all these people would be killed. So they put out an international plea, and they got a bunch of money that came primarily from Southern California, and they built some little cinder block houses out in this part of the outside of the city and made this whole village out there that they called Southern California. So this was the poorest of the poor who had had, uh, who, who had, had these cinder block houses built for them. And they had their basketball court, and that's where we were going to go do the crusade. Okay, so I had, I know you said, you talked a lot, but I, okay, I had to give you the setting here, all right? But, so when we get there, we, we get there that night, well, you know, I go and I'm in my, I'm in my evangelist clothes, you know, whatever, which, I mean, that was just like a pair of khakis and a polo shirt, but still, it wasn't, wasn't work clothes, and so, but anyway, we show up there, and they're starting to set up, well, I thought, you know, I've never been in this place and all that. I said, I'm just going to go walk around. Well, they didn't trust me. Or they didn't, it wasn't they didn't trust me. They didn't trust the people. So they sent a seminary student with me to be my bodyguard, okay? Uh, I had to several times turn around and say, hey, I'm over here, you know, because he'd get distracted. So anyway, so we're walking around. Well, as we're walking around, we, we're just walking, came up on this lady. Go ahead and put that picture up there. Okay, came up on this lady. Now, you can see, and I, I introduced myself, and she introduced herself to me as Mary Jane. Okay? So there's Mary Jane. Now, Mary Jane, just an average person living in this little village, and uh, she had, that's some sticks that she had gone and bought or whatever, she, I don't know how she got them, but that's for her cooking fires and you know, that kind of thing, because they still cooked on open flame and, and that, they didn't have stoves and things. So that was her sticks there, and she was carrying her sticks. And so she had stopped right there, and she put the sticks down. And so I started talking to her. I said, I said oh, you're taking a break? And she said, yes. And I said, are the sticks heavy? And she said, well, a little. And I said, oh, okay. And so we talked a little bit and, and that kind of thing. And I said, uh, and, and so... Because I am such a holy and spiritual person, I heard the, the Holy Spirit speaking within me. <laughs> no. What I heard was the voice of my mama. <laughs> and y'all ever hear the voice of your mama? <laughs> I heard the voice of my mama saying, Hey, boy, carry the woman's sticks. <laughs> right? Cause I, and I was like, you know what? I'm 7,000 miles from home, and I'm in a remote place with no communication, but somehow my mama would find out <laughs> if I didn't carry the woman's sticks. <laughs> so I asked her, I said, well, well, how far do you have to go? And she said, well, just right over that hill right there. And it looked like to be maybe a couple hundred yards. And I said, oh, okay. I said, well, I said, well, let me carry your sticks for you. And she said, oh, no, 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 you can't do it. I said, no. I said, yeah, let me, let me carry them for you. She said, well, okay. So I bent down and I picked up the sticks and I put them up on my shoulder just like she had them in that picture. And we started walking to her home. I'm not doing any great spiritual thing. I am now, as I'm walking through there carrying those sticks, I am some really almighty man of God at that point, right? No, I'm just doing what my mama told me. And I'm just walking along carrying her sticks trying to do a nice thing for a lady. That's it. Well, as we're walking along, there's people sitting along the path there. And they said, and they were, you know, they were speaking in Tagalog. And, uh, and so, 
at certain times, the different things were said. Finally, I asked her, I said, so, so what are these people saying to you? And they said, she said, well, they're asking me, who, are these, who is this man that's carrying my sticks? And I said, oh, okay, okay. And she said, I told them he is my friend from America. I thought, hmm, interesting. I'm her friend. I just met her. I don't know anything about her. She doesn't know me. Now I'm her friend. So then we get to her home, and we get there, and she said, well, just put them right there. I said, no, where do they need to go? So she said, well, take them back here. So I went, put them back there where they were. And I invited her to the crusade, told her all about it, and I said, we're going to be right over there and all that, and it's great. So I said, we'd love to see you. Now, don't get ahead of me. Y'all are already ahead of me, I know, but don't get ahead of me. So we then leave, and I go back. Only person who's with me is this seminary student. So we go. The, they, we had to wait till it got dark. Well, lo and behold, that night, when they started showing that movie, it got dark. People started coming from everywhere. And there were several hundreds of people who came and filled that basketball court area, and several more who were in the, in the edges around it. And they showed the video, they, they sang the songs, they showed the video, and then I got up and made a gospel presentation. When, that, when, when the invitation was given, actual number of people who filled out, who, who put their name on a card and said they had made a decision for Christ, there were 100 people who did that. By far the most number of people ever in any of those crusades. We usually had, we would have four or five. There was a hundred that night. Now I know all of you going, yeah, and Mary Jane was one of them and all her family and all that. I have no idea. Okay, I'm going to disappoint you. I have no idea. It was dark. There were a lot of people. I don't know who, I didn't even talk to those hundred people. I don't know. There were other people that did that. But here's the thing. So we left there, went back to the pastor's house, spent the night, got up the next morning, we're sitting at the breakfast table. And as we're sitting at the breakfast table, the pastor looks across the table at me and he says, all the people were talking about you carrying the woman's sticks. And I said, huh? He said, yeah. They were talking about the fact that you carried the woman's sticks. And I thought, wait a minute, he wasn't there. They weren't there. How, how did... Apparently, me carrying the woman's sticks became the buzz in that entire village. And when he said that, and I had a little time to think about that, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I went right back here to Matthew 20, 27. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. You see, now again, I'm not tooting my own horn here because I didn't do anything in my mind that I thought was some great spiritual act. But I could have because they wanted me to. They didn't want me to go and walk around the village. They didn't want me to go to. They wanted me to go over here and sit on this throne over here and just let them bring me water and stuff and, and then do my big speaking thing. And then that was all I needed to do because I was the man. <laughs> but because I just took a little stroll, heard my mama's voice, and carried a little bundle of sticks a couple hundred yards, the whole village was buzzing. Now, I wasn't the first American to come there. I, and, and in fact, like I said, their whole village was built by people from America. You would think those would be the people they were. But you know, that was just write a check. But I was there, and I actually physically did something. Do I know for sure that that was why so many people came and so many people responded to the invitation? I don't know for sure, but I can tell you this. I didn't carry any sticks anywhere else and we didn't have near that response. I think these words of Jesus 
really do mean something. And so while, yes, we can sit here and look at James and John and their mama and we can say, yeah, they're the big idiots. Well, be careful because that may be us. You see, we don't listen either. And I have to tell you, yeah, I know this story. And that picture of Mary Jane, if you come in my office, that picture is on a shelf in my office because it's there to remind me. But even at that, I forget. But I wonder how many times we are hurting the cause of Christ because we're too good to carry a bundle of sticks. Do I want to be, do I, do I want a place of honor in heaven, in the kingdom? Absolutely I do. Why wouldn't I? And why wouldn't you? But let me tell you, you're never going to get it by being the one who gets served. Or being the one who gets all the credit and glory here. How do you get it? You get it by being a servant. Wow. Obviously, I've heard that story bunches of times because I've told it. (laughs) But every time, it just hits me like a ton of bricks. And it reminds me. I'm preaching to me first. If you get anything, that's just extra. (laughs) But y'all, we all want to sit around and say, I wonder why more people don't come to Jesus. Our, our Our society is just, and I wonder why this church house is not full. And I wonder why all this... Maybe it's not them. Maybe it's us. Maybe we need to become the servants that God desires us to be. Maybe we need to do a little stick carrying. And you know what? You may carry a bundle of sticks and you don't see immediate results. You may do some stick carrying and it doesn't, you don't see anything. But you know, you never know what may be happening that you don't know anything about. Like I said, I didn't know till the next morning it had become the buzz of the village. I didn't know anybody paid any attention. And I wasn't doing it for attention, but it happened. So, you want to be great in God's kingdom? You want to be somebody? You want to, you want to be successful? In God's kingdom, it's not rocket science. (laughs) It's written down right here. It's not going to happen because you jockey for position or politic your way to it. It's going to happen because you're a servant. Now, what does that mean for you today? I don't know. (laughs) That's between you and God. I don't know what you're doing in your life. I don't know where you stand with God. I do know this. I do know that if you're not a child of God, you don't know Jesus as Savior, that you can do all the serving you want, and that's not going to get you anywhere in the kingdom. Because you're not going to serve your way into heaven. You're not going to work your way into heaven. You only get to heaven by receiving Jesus as your Savior, by asking him to forgive you of your sins and turn from your sins and ask him to come into your heart and save you putting your faith and trust in him and him alone for your salvation. That's how you get there. But then once you've got that taken care of, how's your service? What are you doing? Are you just living your life and doing your thing, trying to, trying to make the best for yourself? Well, that was what James and John and their mama was doing for them. And by the way, they were in the inner circle. They were the good guys. So maybe you're in the inner circle. Maybe you're the good guys. I mean, you are here at church on Time Change Sunday, okay? So yeah, maybe you are the good guys. But that doesn't mean that you're doing what God wants. Those guys were the good guys, and they still were lacking. He said, you've got to be a servant. 
So I don't know what being a servant looks like for you or what God's being a servant is for you. But I know that's what he wants. (laughs) Because it's written in red in this book right here. (laughs) That's Jesus' words. So I don't know what you need to do today. I know what I need to do. I don't know what you need to do. But we're going to have a time of response. So Austin, come on down here. And David, I know you and some others are going to come. And we're going we're gonna to have a time of response. Now, this time of response, there, there's nothing magical.